Great. Um, thanks very much for the very kind introduction. And so, yeah, so today I want to tell you about this question that was mentioned in the intro about are dark matter signals hiding in gamma ray data? Now, uh, I, I will say I've been told that every time you put a question in the title, the answer is no. That may be the case in this case as well. I'm not going to tell you that we have discovered dark matter in gamma ray data, but I see this as still an open question, so I want to tell you a bit about, you know, the questions that we're trying to answer, the tools we're trying to use to answer them, and where we currently stand. If the advancer works. Okay, very good. All right, so I want to begin by just introducing the problem. Like, what is dark matter? Why do we think this stuff exists? And how are we going to figure out what it actually is? Then I want to talk about the data set that I'm used in this particular analysis to look into this question, which is gamma rays from our Milky Way galaxy. I want to tell you a bit about the sources of gamma rays that we know are out there as backgrounds to the signals that we're interested in. I'll say a little bit about how we discovered the structures called the Fermi bubbles that were mentioned in the intro, which we believe have nothing to do with dark matter, but we did find them while searching for dark matter in the first place. And then I want to talk about the excess, which will be the main topic of our talk, which, which is often called the galactic center excess, and which might be a possible signal of dark matter. Um, although maybe is more likely than not to be something else. So then I want to talk about the interpretation of that excess, why we think it might be telling us something about dark matter, but also the other possibilities and how we might try to distinguish a dark matter signal from those possibilities. And then I'll get into the methods that we're using, which are starting with sort of simple linear template fitting, going on to a slightly more complicated version of that, which we call non-Poissonian template fitting. And then, so I'll introduce the methods to you, and then I'm going to talk you through what some of the failure modes that we've encountered are in using these techniques and where we're going next. Right. So let me, but, but before I do that, actually, I just want to do a little bit of advertising. So I am an associate professor in the physics department, as was said. I'm also a senior investigator in this NSF-funded AI Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions, IFI. Um, IFI is a great community. There's a lot of really interesting machine learning work there, and it's uh, focusing on the intersection with physics. But both, the idea of iFi is both using machine learning to understand fundamental physics and using insights from physics to try to do better machine learning. So if you are interested, uh, we have a website, we have a mailing list. Um, um, if you're at a Boston area institution, feel free to get involved. My second little advertising point is if you were a student here who has an interest in the intersection of physics and data science, I wanted to advertise that our department is now offering this joint PhD in physics, statistics, and data science so if you would like more information about that, uh, you can check out that address. All right, that's my obligatory advertising. Now I'm going to talk about the science. So. All right, so the basic puzzle of dark matter, and why I and many others spend a lot of my time thinking about it, is that we have pretty good evidence that more than 80% of all the matter in our universe is something that we don't understand. We call it dark matter to parameterize our ignorance. Dark here means that as far as we can tell, it doesn't carry electric charge or interact with light and it interacts at most very weakly with known particles, except through gravity. We have multiple lines of evidence for, this, for the statement that I just made, um, ranging from the fact that galaxies exist at all in our universe in the form that they do, we think is a consequence of the presence of dark matter, how stars and gas clouds orbit around galaxies, observations of colliding galaxy clusters, and imprints left in the earliest light from the early universe, the cosmic microwave background radiation, all support this statement. But all of those probes of dark matter are measuring its gravitational effects. They are measuring its gravitational pull on the matter that we can actually see. And that is how we have learned everything that we currently know about dark matter. But that's already enough to tell us that we don't have a good explanation for what dark matter is within the physics that we understand. There are no good candidates for this within well understood known physics. So this positions it as one of our largest clues to what might lie beyond known physics. So of the stakes, just 80% of the matter in the universe. So you can, uh, I'll, I'm happy to go into more detail later, but it, the most precise measurement comes from the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is a snapshot of, the, which effectively gives us a snapshot of what the universe looked like when it was only three or 400,000 years old. So this was before stars, before galaxies. The universe was basically just a sea of charged particles and light and neutrinos, and we think also dark matter. And basically, there were little fluctuations in that sea, ripples left over from, from the beginning of the universe. And you can look at how those ripples evolve. 
And basically, if you have matter that only feels gravity and doesn't feel radiation pressure, if you have a region with more matter than other regions, gravity will cause more matter to collapse onto that region. So it's a positive feedback effect, and the density fluctuations will grow. But if you try to cram a lot of charged particles together <laughs> in a small region, it's not going to work. The radiation pressure will push them back out. So what we see is that these fluctuations oscillate, and the properties of the oscillations depend on how much matter you have that interacts only gravitationally versus how much matter you have that interacts both gravitationally and with radiation. And you find that you need about five times as much of the first category to explain the observation. So that's where the 80% number comes from. But yeah, it's a percent level of precision measurement at this point. Very cool. All right, so how might we look for it? If we can advance. So there has been going on for decades a large multifaceted experimental physics program to try to search for interactions between the dark matter and the standard model other than through gravity. We don't know for sure that these interactions exist. It might be that the only interactions are gravitational, but in a lot of scenarios for what dark matter could be, we do expect there to be some weak non-gravitational interactions between the dark and visible matter. So you can ask how might such interactions manifest? So SM here stands for the visible matter. It means the standard model of particle physics. DM stands for dark matter. So these are sort of three very classic possible ways these interactions might manifest. The first one, indirect detection. Sorry. Indirect detection. This is a mnemonic that I jumped for to you. The first one, indirect detection, says what if two dark matter particles or dark matter and dark antimatter could crash together and generate standard model particles? In that case, what we would be looking for is looking at regions where there's a lot of dark matter and looking for standard model particles appearing apparently from nowhere in those regions. And that we call indirect detection. You can flip this diagram around and say you can also look for dark matter particles bouncing off standard model particles, causing them to recoil. And that we call direct detection. And you can look for these recoiling standard model particles in underground detectors. And the third interaction structure that people think about a lot is you can reverse the diagram and say, well, if we smash standard model particles together at sufficiently high energies, we could create some dark matter particles. And my favorite mnemonic for these three channels is uh, break, you can break the dark matter in the standard model particles, you can shake up the standard model with dark matter particles, or you can try to make the dark matter at accelerators. So you can break it, shake it, or make it to try to look for non-gravitational interactions between dark and visible matter. Now this talk is going to focus on this first kind of signal, an indirect detection signal. So we're working under the hypothesis that if dark matter particles could collide with each other and produce visible particles, we want to look for a signal of that type. OK, so and as in the title of my talk, we're going to look for a signal of that type in gamma rays. So why should we look in gamma rays in particular versus all the other particles that could be produced by this process? Well, light and neutrinos are good here because they're uncharged particles, so they travel to us in straight lines. If such a collision were produce, to produce charged particles out there somewhere in space, it would generally um, travel on non-straight lines due to the galactic magnetic field. And so that makes it harder to figure out where the original collision happened, trace back its property. So light is good. Light. So even though dark matter is dark, we're positing here a small interaction that allows it to produce light. And if that happened, that would potentially give us a lot of information about the dark matter. So why gamma rays? Well, gamma rays are the highest energy form of light. This is a nice little cartoon of the wavelength of different kinds of light compared to various uh, physical quantities. And gamma rays are right at the high energy end of this spectrum. So you can ask, OK, what, why are we interested in the highest energy light? Well, you know, to give you a hint, partly we're interested in the highest energy light because there's an interesting signal there. But, um, but, even, but if we didn't know that, a priori, if you think about if you think about, suppose dark matter had a mass comparable to other particles we know about, like an electron or a proton or a W or Z boson, if the dark matter particles were to annihilate with each other, like a matter-antimatter reaction, that releases an amount of energy determined by mc squared, where m is the mass of the dark matter. And you can work out what that energy would be. And for all the known fundamental particles, it would be in the gamma ray energy range. So you know, it's plausible. We should look in gamma rays. And it will give us information about dark matter with mass scales around the mass scale of the particles we already know about. And there are also very simple dark matter scenarios where this kind of annihilation process, dark matter colliding and destroying itself, determines how much dark matter you have left in the universe at late times, because most of it destroyed itself through this process. And that points to a mass scale around 1 giga electron volt to 1 tera electron volt. Just the scale here, with, I'm often going to measure energy or mass in, uh, in GeV. And 1 GeV is about a billion times the energy of the light coming from the lights in this room. They're about the EV scale. OK, so that's why we want to look in gamma rays. So what kind of gamma ray signals should, would we get, would we expect to get from dark matter? 
So our hypothesis, which is unconfirmed, is that dark matter collisions could give rise to visible particles, and this could be anything in the standard model, like gauge bosons or quarks, leptons, protons, antiprotons, neutrons, antineutrons. So this is the sketch over here. Two dark matter particles come in, some new physics occurs, which is what we would like to understand, and some visible particles are produced. But most of the particles that we know about are actually unstable. They decay away on short time scales. So when they decay away, they will produce the long-lived known particles. So that's photons, neutrinos, electrons, protons, the antiparticles of electrons and protons and neutrinos, and possibly also a bit in the way of atomic nuclei and the, and the antinuclei. So, the, so, the, so this is the picture here. So the end point of this process is that we get some long-lived known particles, including photons. So it's actually very generic that if the dark matter particles can collide and make standard model particles, there will be some photons popping out at the end of the process. That's, that's, a, that's a very general prediction. All right, so the signal we want to look for is photons coming from regions that had dark matter in them. So it would be helpful to know here how the dark matter is distributed. So now, so we can either try to model theoretically how the dark matter should be distributed through the galaxy, or we can try to figure it out observationally by looking at the gravitational pull of that dark matter on stars. And here are two of my colleagues over in the MIT Kavli Institute for Astrophysics who do excellent work on these two fronts. Uh, I don't know, yeah, the color, sorry about the color shading on this isn't actually ideal, but this is a sketch of a simulation of the dark matter density throughout our galaxy. So this is the sky projected onto a sphere. So this is a map of the sky. The center of this image is the center of our Milky Way galaxy. I don't know if you can see it, but the image is darkest there in indicating that we expect most of the dark matter in, the, that we expect the dark matter in the galaxy to preferentially collect near the center of the galaxy. And this is just because that's where the gravitational potential well is deepest. So we expect in general lots of dark matter at the center of our galaxy, but then there can be other clumps of dark matter, some with stars attached, some not, orbiting around the broader galaxy. So that is, broadly speaking, how we expect the distribution to behave. That said, there are still very significant uncertainties on the dark matter distribution. If you simulate a random galaxy, there's no guarantee it's going to look like our Milky Way, and the measurements of the distribution of dark matter towards the galactic center are very hard to do and have large uncertainties. But broadly speaking, we might look for a signal that peaks towards the galactic center and doesn't look like the spiral disk of our Milky Way. This image, the dark matter halo is expected to be sort of much more spherical than the spiral disk. So that's the thing that we can look for. The other thing that we can look for is a characteristic energy scale for the photons that just depends on the properties of the dark matter particle and how it interacts with the standard model. So in particular, these photons should be coming out with roughly the same amount of energy everywhere we look in the galaxy. It shouldn't depend on where you are. It just depends on the particle physics. So those are the features of the signal that we're going to look for. Gamma rays with this sort of roughly spherical distribution coming from the region around the galactic center with a characteristic energy scale that's related to how the dark matter converts into standard model particles. OK, so now, so then we can also think about, OK, what, what are our backgrounds going to be? You know, this is, this is the signal, but what do we have to contend with? So there are many other sources of gamma rays in our galaxy, and that provides a complex and structured background. And so our data analysis challenge is going to be to, disentang to try to disentangle this dark matter signal from everything else that might be going on. So the major diffuse background comes from this upper image is a map of the gas density in our galaxy. And uh, so the major source of gamma rays comes from when charged cosmic rays rocketing through our galaxy at close to the speed of light smash into the, this interstellar gas creating gamma rays. There is a little animation, which uh, Advancer isn't working on. Can you guys, yeah. So the picture here is a proton, a gas particle is traveling through the galaxy, minding its own business. Cosmic ray comes along and smashes into it. That produces subatomic particles called pions, and then these decay to gamma rays with high probability. So we expect to see a background of gamma rays that mostly traces the density of the gas in the galaxy, but modulated by how many cosmic ray protons there are around. We also expect there to be point sources of gamma rays throughout our galaxy. Spinning neutron stars can make gamma rays. Supernovae have, when stars explode and produce a supernova explosion, that's bright in gamma rays, and it can have a gamma ray afterglow as well. So the supernova remnants can produce gamma rays. Even in, in other galaxies, there can be energetic processes like jets from black holes. They shine in gamma rays and show up as point sources of gamma ray emission in our signal. So these are all things we will need to contend with when looking for a dark matter signal. Okay, 
So how might we begin by modeling it? So, wait, so everything I show you here is using public data from the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which was launched in 2008. So it's been up there for 14 years. And this first image up here is a picture of the gamma ray sky as seen by Fermi. This bright band along the center is the plane of our Milky Way galaxy. Just like if, you, if you're in the right place and you look up at the sky at night, you can see a band of stars across the sky. That's the Milky Way, same thing here, just in gamma rays. So, the first thing that you might try to do, and what we did when the Fermi data first came out, was essentially just to say, all right, we're going to model this sky as a linear combination of different physical contributions to the gamma ray emission. And we're going to say that each of them has, we don't know how much there is of each component. So we're going to have a coefficient, a free coefficient associated with each component. And we're going to sum up those components. And we're just going to try to maximize the likelihood as a function of those coefficients. So this we call template fitting. It's just a frequentist maximum likelihood analysis, at least the way we did it back in 2009 to 2010. So what our data is actually a list of photons, but we typically make them into an image. We bin them into spatial pixels and also sort them by energy. And then we construct templates for the various backgrounds, predicting the expected number of gamma rays in each pixel, in each energy bin, from various physical sources. So this is a very simple example. We might have one component here which represents the galactic diffuse emission. So this is mostly from protons hitting the gas in the galaxy. So it's brightest along the disk of the Milky Way, which is where all the interstellar gas is. And then this is, uh, this is just isotropic emission corresponding to emission in other galaxies, which are roughly uniformly distributed across the sky. You might say, wait, that doesn't look isotropic. There's a, you know, th this is clearly not flat. What's going on here? That's because so, so when building these templates, we have to take into account that the telescope doesn't look at all parts of the sky equally, and also that the telescope has a finite angular resolution. So these templates will be, so these are templates for what you actually expect to see. So they built, so this builds in the exposure of the telescope, that it looks at different areas for different amounts of time and also includes some smearing because the telescope has a finite angular resolution. It actually smears all point sources out to about the size of the moon. So this is this kind of a blurry image. Then we model the expected number of photons in every pixel just as a linear combination of the predictions from each of these templates with coefficients alpha L. We, and then we, max it, we compute the likelihood of the data given this model for each pixel, just using a Poisson likelihood. We treat these as independent events. And then we take the product of all the pixel likelihoods to get the overall likelihood. And then we, and then we maximize that likelihood and find the values of these coefficients alpha L that give us, the, um, that, that give us our best fit model. All right, so you've got a best fit model. What are you going to do with it? Great. Well, one thing that you might do is say, is my best fit model actually any good? Like, does it describe what I see in the sky? And one thing that you can do for that is you can subtract, you can, um, you, you can look at the residuals when you subtract off the best fit model. So the first step in this is we're going to remove the bright point sources. So this, we have separate templates for all the bright point sources, the ones that you can distinguish at high significance. You fit them, um, you, you just fit them and remove them. So that's this left panel over here. This is the data before you subtract anything. Then we're going to subtract some point sources. I don't know if I'm using this advance right there we go okay so then you get a result that looks like this which is the diffuse emission and these white dots are just places where the subtraction was uh, bad or where the emission is very bright and we've just masked them out okay Th those are not physical those are analysis choices so then this is what the sky looks like after the subtraction of the point sources and so then we can subtract off our best fit combination of templates and see what's left and in that case what happens is something like this so I want you to notice two things here um, so black here means more intense emission, white means over subtraction in this case. So first, this model is not fantastic. Like that's the, you, you can see that there are residuals not consistent with noise all over the sky. Um, this is going to be a generic challenge in facing this. We can, we can build template models that are accurate at the 1% level, that have like only percent level residuals, but that's not consistent with noise. Like we, we have enough photons that these models are very not consistent with noise and understanding uh, how to deal with that is, is a significant issue. But in this, as well as all this, you know, clearly non-noise residuals along here, you may be able to see this kind of figure eight shaped structure in the center of the map. And I'll outline it for you in red. So those are the structures called the Fermi bubbles, which my collaborators and I discovered by doing the exercise that I just showed you back in, uh, back in 2010. We won a prize for this, and at the prize ceremony, they were like, they used very sophisticated statistical techniques to find these bubbles, and I was like, like, you know, like we did a linear regression and then we subtracted the model and looked at what was left. It was not actually very sophisticated. But um, 
Anyway, so those are the structures called the Fermi bubbles. And so these are giant, so this is a slightly prettier picture of the Fermi bubbles with a, with a color scheme. So these are giant double lobe structures centered at the galactic center, extending 50 degrees to the north and south of the galactic center. So they're huge. They're, so th this corresponds to about a 30,000 light year height for each of these bubbles. They shine brightly in gamma rays between 1 and 100 GeV. And since we found them in the gamma rays, people have also observed counterparts in the X-ray and microwaves. And they may be a relic of activity of the black hole at the center of the galaxy over the last 10 million years. So they're sort of a, a way to do galactic archaeology. So that was really interesting. But the reason we had originally looked at this data set was to try to find a dark matter signal. And these very clearly, the, these pretty clearly have nothing to do with dark matter. I said the dark matter signal should look, you know, roughly spherical. This is not spherical. It has very sharp edges that tells you that it's something that's interacting. It's, it's not dark matter. Um, all right. So if we did want to look for a dark matter signal, what might we do? Well, that's where the bubbles are. But really, for a dark matter signal, I'd like to look in towards the region around the galactic center where most of the dark matter in the galaxy was supposed to pile up. And so we're now going to look into this region. So around the same time that my collaborators and I were, uh, fight, were discovering the Fermi bubbles, there, uh, another group led by Lisa Goodenough and Dan Hooper had pointed out that if you look in this region, there's also some stuff going on that we don't understand in this data set. So this image is showing after you subtract, so this is now a zoom in on the galactic center region. There's a few degrees for each region around the center of our galaxy. Um, this is after subtracting the point sources, but before subtracting any kind of model for the diffuse background. And again, you see this stripe is the, um, is the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. But when you subtract off our best estimate model for the emission associated with the gas of the Milky Way galaxy, you're left with this blob-like structure around the center of the galaxy. Now, um, in this picture, it looks like, if you're paying attention to the axis labels, this is about a one degree radius. So it looks like this is only within the degree or so of the center of the galaxy. But um, Dan Hooper and I showed in 2013 that actually th this is just an artifact of the color bar this excess, this roughly spherical excess, actually extends out at least 5,000 light years from the galactic center, which corresponds to about 10 degrees, fills this whole region. Um, it's been confirmed by a large number of other groups, including the uh, collaboration that runs the telescope. This lower plot is showing how this signal varies as a function of energy. The analysis that I told you before, where we extract the coefficients of the templates, you can put in a template for this excess and then extract its coefficient as a function of energy, and you get a result that looks like these red and black data points here. The red and black were, attempted to, were an early attempt at estimating the systematic uncertainties. And uh, this is kind of a pre these, these colored lines going through here are the gamma ray signal that you would expect from various different models of dark matter. So um, that is, yeah, so, and, and you can see that you, know, you can find models of dark matter which go through these lines pretty clearly. There's kind of a preferred energy for this signal around a couple of GeV, and that suggests that that allows you to fit this signal pretty well with dark matter that is modestly heavier than that, tens of GeV. And there have been many studies of this doing many variations of the linear combination of fixed templates approach that I have just told you about. Okay, so that's, um, that's pretty interesting. You know, it, looks, it has a lot of properties that I just told you would be characteristic of a dark matter signal. But as always, we have to worry about what else it could be. And the leading other candidate explanation is that what we're looking at could be a new population of pulsars. So spinning neutron stars making gamma rays. So, and, the, and the best, the sort of simplest argument for that is this is again the energy spectrum of the excess. So these data points are showing the power per logarithmic interval in energy in the excess. These are statistical errors only. The black line is a fitted, is a dark matter model that's been fitted to the data. These dashed lines though are not fits. They are observations of the energy spectra of gamma ray pulsars in Fermi. And you can see that they're rather similar at the low energies, they're not as similar, but the low energies are also where the systematic uncertainties not shown on this plot become largest. Um, so, you know, so, so the energy spectrum is pretty consistent between pulsars and the excess that we see. So what we would like to understand is, what we would like to do is infer the fraction of the excess that is attributable to different physical mechanisms. Now that could be 100% of one and 0% of the other, but there also could be some linear combination of different things going on here. So how might we do that? The, we're already kind of using the energy spectrum because we don't know a priori what the energy spectrum from dark matter would be. All we can really say is that it's consistent with either of them. 
but maybe we can use spatial information. So one possible observational handle is that in the kinds of dark matter scenarios we're thinking about, dark matter is some, is some particle. There will be dark matter particles along every single line of sight towards the galactic center. But pulsars are stars. There will not necessarily be a pulsar along every line of sight to the galactic center. So the dark matter signal we would expect to be smooth up to Poisson fluctuations, but the pulsar signal we would expect to look more like a bunch of dots on the sky. So maybe we can tell those things apart. It would be very easy if it was just like this. The two complicating factors here are that, well, if there's a large enough number of pulsars and they're faint enough, then you will not be able to tell these two things apart. There, won't be, there will be a pulsar along every line of sight to the galactic center if there are enough of them. As I said before, the instrument has kind of blurry vision. The angular resolution is, is not fantastic. So if you blur all these dots together, it will look smooth. And the other problem is that, as I said before, there is that big background from cosmic rays interacting with the gas, which is about 10 times as large as the excess and is highly structured and is sitting on top of this. So um, nonetheless, if we say, all right, but uh, let's, let's, let's you know, try to do this anyway. Let's try to develop a statistical technique to uh, distinguish these two scenarios. What you can do is say, well, let's just stick for the moment with our template fitting technique. And, but what we can change is that the likelihood for the point source contributions won't be Poissonian anymore. So let me just talk you through the, uh, the, the general idea of this. And I, can, I have a backup slide with the, with the detailed math if people want to see the detailed math, given this audience. But basically, the idea is the point source popular. If, if I knew exactly where all the point sources were, then I would have Poissonian statistics. I would just predict that some pixels would have more emission in them than others. That would raise my, ex my Poissonian expectation value. But the distribution of photons from that source would still just follow Poisson statistics. But in this case, I have an extra unknown. Like, I don't know where the point sources are in the first place. I don't know where the pulsars are. So I can say that as I have to do draw draws from like two distributions. One distribution that says, how many pulsars do I expect in this pixel to begin with? And then a second distribution that says, how many photons do I expect from any given pulsar? And that changes the, the statistics of the problem. You can say that it, you know, it changes the relationship between the mean and the variance. If I was doing some Gaussian approximation, although we don't do a Gaussian approximation, we follow the full distribution. So I mean, just as a crude example, if I were to tell you that my model predicts 10 photons per pixel in some region of the sky, and I say, what's the probability that I find 0 or 12 or 100 photons, the first thing that you might do is say, right, well, I'll assume they're independent. I'll give you the Poisson probabilities of those things. So the probability of getting 12 photons is then about 10%. The pro you just plug into the Poisson distribution. The probability of getting zero photons is a few times 10 to the minus 5. And if you see 100 photons, you've done something wrong. Like there's a problem with your model. We don't have 10 to the 63 pixels. The probability is extremely tiny. But now I say, all right, let's uh, consider the case where I have a population of rare sources. So what, when I said I had an expectation value of 10 photons per pixel, what I really meant was that there's a 10% chance of getting a source in each pixel, and each of those sources produces 100 photons. This is an exaggerated version. This is not what we expect to happen in the real data. But then the expected mean number of photons is the same, but the probability of getting a given number of photons is completely different. My probability of getting zero photons is more like 90%. My probability of getting 100 photons is now quite reasonable. It's a few times 10 to the minus 3, because I just need to get a source in that pixel and then get the expected number of photons from that source. My probability of getting 12 photons is really tiny. <laughs> 10 to the minus 29, because I have to get a source there, and then I need a big downward fluctuation in the number of photons from the source. So while the expectation values are the same, the probability distributions are completely different in these two cases. And we can use that as a distinguishing factor. So this is the method of non-Poissonian template fitting. It's just a linear template fit as previously. We're going to model the sky as a linear combination of different templates. In this fit, the templates we're using are a model for the galactic diffuse emission, a model for the Fermi bubbles, a model for isotropic extragalactic emission, and a model for a smooth component corresponding to this galactic center excess. But then we can also add templates corresponding to distributions of point sources, where we don't know the locations of the actual point sources. And the only difference is that the contributions to the likelihood coming from these templates is modified compared to the Poissonian case. It's modified by an amount that depends on how the sources are distributed with respect to brightness. The example I gave you was like a delta function at 100 photons per source, but we can be broader than that. So we, in our baseline analyses, we just parameterize this source count function as a broken power law. And so the parameters of that power law, the position of the break in the power law, and the slope above and below the break are parameters that we put into the fit. 
and we vary over them when we compute the likelihood. So this is right. So this is just looking at the number, um, the, the the number of um, sources producing a given number of photons as a as and will have will allow the source population the number of sources to also vary as a function of position. So we can model source populations that are isotropic as appropriate for sources in other galaxies like active galactic nuclei, sources that follow the disk of the galaxy as appropriate for pulsars or supernova remnants, and sources that, and a hypothetical source population that makes up the galactic center axis. So we are then going to say, right, this is our model. It has one coefficient associated with each of these for the overall normalization. It has four coefficients associated with each of these, four parameters associated with each of these point source models. We will compute a giant likelihood as a function of all these parameters and then seek to maximize it. And we can either do a frequentness analysis or a Bayesian analysis. In this paper in 2016, we use this to build up the posterior probability distribution for, the, for all the parameters in the model. So when you do that, you get a few different things. So you can, you can reconstruct the inferred source count functions of the different populations. So this is how many sources you have as a function of how bright they are. The blue line here is showing the result for sources in the disk of the galaxy. The black line is showing observed known sources in the Fermi data as a function of their brightness. So, and you can see that this blue line is basically picking up the bright known sources, which are expected. We know that the bright sources do trace the disk of the galaxy, pulsar supernova eminence. But then this, this initial fit back in 2016 found, I said, returned a best fit containing a large point source population associated with the galactic center excess with the source count function that followed this orange line. So what this, and, and this where the source count function drops rapidly is right about where the telescope starts losing sensitivity to detect the individual point sources. So this suggested that there was a big population of point sources in this excess um, hiding just below the sensitivity of the telescope. We can also look at the posterior probability distribution for just the amount of photons associated with the different physical components here. So I told you this was what we were trying to infer. So, uh, this, um, so in this image, these are posterior probability distributions for most important ones to look at are this orange line here and this red line here. The orange line is the total photons associated with the, ex with the hypothetical source population making up the excess. And the red line is the hypothetical smooth, pop smooth component, like a dark matter component contributing to the excess. And you see, so in 2016, we concluded, right, the fit really doesn't want a smooth component. It just wants the excess to be completely made of point sources. This, this inlay is just what happens if you don't allow there to be point sources. In that case, the fit recovers a smooth component that looks like the excess, because that's the only option for it to explain the excess. And we found that the Bayes factor preferring the case with point sources in the excess to no point sources in the excess was a base factor of about 10 to the 9. So you look at that, we looked at that in 2016, and we're like, great, it's pulsars. You know, end of, end, end of the story, we've discovered a new pulsar population, no evidence for dark matter in here, we're done. Uh, so short version, we weren't done. <laughs> uh, so a few years later, so a couple of years later, a postdoc and I looked back at this analysis and said, all right, but what could be going wrong? Because the basic problem in these template analyses is that we're essentially putting in a very hard prior, a, a very rigid prior that the spatial distribution of the different emission components looks like what we think it does. Okay? Now that's based on some model of where the gas is in the galaxy and where the cosmic rays are in the galaxy. And that's pretty hard to infer at high levels of accuracy because we've got exactly one point in the galaxy from which we can try to measure this stuff. So we have a good picture of, say, the two-dimensional distri projected distribution of the gas in the galaxy, but we can't put telescopes out throughout the galaxy and look at it from different angles. So there are inevitably going to be errors in that gas distribution. Similarly, the distribution of the, uh, sorry, we can go, go back. The distributions of the unresolved point sources, what I, when I, I said, okay, we're gonna put in this disk component and this isotropic component and this GC component, um, we can guess them from looking at the bright sources, but we don't know in detail how the unresolved sources are distributed. So there can be errors in both, and, and in the signal model, you know, we don't know exactly what the dark matter distribution is in the center of the galaxy. What we've been putting in so far is just like a simple functional form, like a power law. Um, you know, I mean, that seems kind of reasonable, but the truth could be somewhat different. The pulsar distribution, we know even less from first principles. We haven't detected pulsars in that region of the galaxy before. So, so then the question becomes, all right, if your background model's imperfect and your signal model's imperfect, 
how much does it change the answer? And the answer, unfortunately, is it can change it by quite a lot. Okay, so here is one useful test that it occurred to us to do after a few years of looking at this data, was to let's try adding a fake signal into the pipeline, see if we can get it back. We tried completely fake signals before. We tried running the pipeline on simulated data and checked that that worked, that was fine. But if there's so a thing that you can do is take your simulated dark matter signal and just add it to the real data and then run the pipeline on that and see if you can recover the dark matter signal that you put in. And the answer, unfortunately, is that at least the 2016 era pipeline does not. So these plots on the right are showing these posteriors again. The, this first panel is the baseline analysis. The purple line now is the point sources in the excess, and the red line is, as we saw previously, the smooth component that is going to zero. So then we injected a smooth signal on top of that, which is shown by this blue line. So what should happen is that the red posterior moves up to match the blue line. That's not what happens. The red line stays at zero, and the purple uh, line corresponding to the posterior of the point sources goes up by the amount that you injected. So the pipeline is saying, oh, the stuff that you injected, it was point sources. We know it wasn't. It was, it was smooth. It was dark matter. You can push this further. You can inject more dark matter, and you can see in this panel still the inferred amount of point sources just keeps going up. And to actually get a non-zero um, coefficient for the amount of smooth emission, you need to inject a signal that is about five times larger than the actual excess. And at that point, it will start picking up that, that, yes, you really did put some smooth emission into this. Basically, the problem here is that the baseline fit is actually preferring a negative component for the smooth emission. So that's unphysical because of our prior ranges. We didn't catch it at first. Can you move on? So you can mitigate this. Um, so you can mitigate that problem to some degree by using updated background models. When you do that, the evidence for point sources also drops way down from that base factor of 10 to the 9 to something that's more like a two sigma or three sigma preference. There's another kind of error that you can have, which is, so I talked about issues in the background model. So issues in the signal model are also a problem. My postdoc and I were trying to understand what did different regions of the excess drive the preference by different amounts. So we subdivided the signal template into regions. And in this analysis, we had more data and the apparent evidence for pulsars was even stronger. It was about 10 to the 15. But as soon as we chopped the signal template in half, it went down to less than 10, the apparent evidence in favor of point sources. And we reproduced that behavior in simulations with a perfect background model, just an asymmetric diffuse signal. So the pipeline is not actually doing something wrong here. The question you were asking it is, which is preferred, a smooth symmetric signal or a point source-like symmetric signal? And it is saying correctly that the point source-like symmetric signal is preferred. But it turns out a smooth asymmetric signal do does even better. So um, errors in the overall shape of the signal template can drive pretty strong apparent evidence for point sources. Um, and this is, yeah, this is just showing, this is what happens when we split the signal in half. These are the posteriors for the smooth component, north and south of the galactic plane in red and blue. You can see they are suddenly not zero anymore. And then these panels are showing what happens if you force the template to be symmetric. You find a zero detection of a smooth component and a large detection of a point source component. And then this bottom panel is just the same thing in simulations where there's only a smooth asymmetric component. And again, you find that if you force the signal to be symmetric, you get this spurious high significance detection of point sources. OK. So those are some things that can go wrong. <laughs> we can move on. So, um, so right. So, so that's, and that's more or less where we stand at present. Um, we, you know, so, so we have this signal, this high significance signal. There's a ton of data present. Um, but disentangling the smooth emission from the point source-like emission seems difficult, given our current lack of, lack of uh, certainty on the background model. Now, the specific pipeline that I described here does make several approximations and ad hoc choices and work by my colleague, Shirsten Perez, and her, student, and her students and collaborators has helped improve on some of these approximations and assumptions. But perhaps a more important issue is just the fundamental issue of this fixed, um, of this template approach is that the likelihood that I told you about was just a product of all the pixel likelihoods. It's not including any information about which pixels are next to each other. Like you could scramble all the pixels in the data set, and the data set would be exactly the same from the perspective of the pipeline that I have just described. The current pipeline also doesn't use any energy information for this. So one, uh, can you advance? So one, sorry. Uh, okay. So. One potential way is to say, all right, how can we dig more information out of, the, out of the data set and use that to try to stabilize this pipeline? So 
And this is largely uh, not my work, but, uh, so, but I just want to mention it because I think it's exciting. So there's been work done by a couple of groups on using neural networks to try to, um, to, try to do simulation-based inference and learn properties of this data set that are not just effectively the, the number of counts per, the, the histogram of number of counts per pixel. So the idea would be to train neural networks on simulations based on these template models, seeking to distinguish diffuse emission. And it's the same goal. You're still trying to distinguish diffuse emission from a population of sources. But the hope is that you can capture information from multi-pixel structures, in this case, not just from uh, the single pixel likelihoods. So there are a couple of complementary methods that have been developed. Um, by Florian List et al. and by Siddharth Mishra Sharma, who gave one of the lightning talks earlier, and Kyle Kramer. And both of these studies did a number of tests, like the ones I just showed you with the injection test and with splitting the template uh, and seeing how much that changes things, and found that this approach was indeed more robust to errors in the signal and background templates compared to what we were doing previously. Um, these approaches so far are not using energy and any energy information either, but it's a natural future direction. And, uh, so this is, just, this is just an example of one of these. Uh, we can advance to the next. Great, thanks. Um, this is just an example of using one of these neural network methods about what they find. So the first panel here is showing the original pipeline. This is slightly different data set, improved background models. This is showing the um, fraction of flux in the point source template versus the dark matter template. You can see there is a pretty strong degeneracy between the two of them. Um, in this case, they. So yeah, this is what, what I, when I said before that you would use improved background models, the significance for point sources drops way down. Um, th this is what I mean. So this is not a very strong detection of point sources, but there's some of it. Um, going, to the, going to the neural network case, what was found in this case was that their preference for point sources went down a little bit, that they do want you know, a smooth component in their data set, but there was still an apparent detection of point sources at about the two sigma level, and this result seemed to be significantly more robust to errors in the templates compared to what we were doing before. Okay, so I'm, I'm at the end of my time, so I'm just going to say very briefly, this isn't the only way to make progress on this problem. There's work being done by other groups just on trying to get better background models as opposed to reducing the sensitivity to having a bad background model. Um, you can focus on, you can throw away this idea of trying to look for point sources versus diffuse emission and just look at the overall morphology of the signal. You can try to look for pulsars at different frequencies or also for dark matter signals at different frequencies or in different locations. Um, there have been some claims of possible counterpart dark matter signals, although none of them are on especially solid ground. So the galactic center excess, who I've told you, is a fairly robust feature of the central region of the Milky Way. The leading explanations are a new population of pulsars or an exotic signal from annihilating dark matter. But this is a data analysis challenge telling the difference between these two things in a way that is robust to our uncertainties in the background models um, appears to be quite difficult. Non-Poissonian template fitting methods are initially found a pretty strong preference for most or all of the excess to be attributed to point sources. But later studies cast doubt on this preference. We showed that this pipeline can be biased pretty readily by errors in the background model or the signal model. We're hoping that use of additional information in the data may help stabilize the results against mismodeling. There's some evidence that new neural network-based methods are more robust, and they still find some evidence for point sources. But we're still not using all the information in the data, and we may learn more about this signal from counterparts in other regions. So um, stay tuned. Thanks very much. That's a brilliant, that's a wonderful question. Yeah, so the question was, can you use timing information? So the telescope does have timing information. It measures the arrival time of every photon to the nanosecond level. Um, the problem here is that the individual pulsars, we, so we don't know where they are. And the, at the level of brightness that we're talking about here, each pulsar is probably giving you less than 10 photons over the 14 year lifetime of Fermi. Now that's it. If we knew which 10 photons were coming from the pulsar, Fourier transforms are amazing. And you know, with nanosecond timing resolution, you could still potentially find the pulsations. Um, but the problem is that, again, this pulsar is sitting on top of a background that is brighter than it. So what you'll actually see is there are 100 photons in the pixel, and you don't know which 10 of them come from the pulsar. So that makes it very computationally intensive to do the pulsar search. But it is something that we've thought about a bit, because you could try to look at like the very brightest pulsars in this population and see if you could go after them in gamma rays. Probably the more, um, 
but probably the easier route to go is we have this um, new um, uh, this new radio telescope, Meerkat, in South Africa that's looking for pulsars in exactly this region. And in radio, you would expect to see a lot more photons. And so if we could detect the pulsars in radio and then cross-correlate with bright spots in the gamma rays, that would be a, a good way to establish that the pulsar explanation was the truth, if it is. But yeah, I, but it's a really interesting question about can you do anything in gamma rays? The, the difficulty is just that from each pulsar, the number of photons is small, but, but maybe.